Are we bass players making Bach roll around in his grave? What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and I think most people agree that one of the most satisfying experiences you can have is playing the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. This is true for classical bassists, jazz bassists, electric bassists, tuba players, you name it. Now, most of us bassists are drawn at some point to the solo Bach cello suites. It's wonderful music to dig into, but there are a lot of pitfalls, so we're going to talk about the pros and cons of playing Bach on the bass. Take a look at the first cello suite in particular on the bass, plus an extra tip for making any Bach sing on the bass, so be sure to stick around for that. Pros for learning Bach? Well, there's really one. I mean, it's some of the greatest music ever written. I mean, why wouldn't you want to play Bach and tap into that genius? It's so great for your musicianship, no matter what type of music you play. The big con of learning Bach is just the challenge level. Bach can seem deceptively easy at first, but once you get into his music, particularly the cello suites, it can get really frustrating and discouraging really quickly if you're not careful. That doesn't mean you shouldn't dig into the cello suites or any other Bach. I think it's wonderful to do. If you have any desire at all, go for it. Today, we'll take the first cello suite as an example. I'll I'll go through and play a little bit from each movement. I'll be doing that using this special bow, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Okay, let's dive into the first Bach cello suite. There are many great additions, but this is one done by the wonderful Michael Kurth from the Atlanta Symphony. We've got it linked to in our sheet music store in the description below. And one of the first things you'll notice about this edition is that it's written an octave below where we're playing it. This is actually the sounding pitch of bass. We could do a whole video on that if you want. It might be kind of a boring video, but so even though it looks like it's written to be like, in reality, we played up here. Now, <laughs> If you ever want to feel a little bit depressed while playing the bass, just pick up a cello or watch a cellist play this. This is like a beginner almost level piece technically for cello, particularly uh, the, the prelude. Um, not really, and of course musically it's just absolutely fabulous, but it just sits so well in the cello. It's like open strings in first position to start. If you're finding value in this, hit that like button, consider subscribing, and be sure to stick around for that tip on how to make any Bach more manageable on the bass. The other thing you're probably wondering about, or maybe, is what the heck is Jason playing on here? This is a Baroque 
bow, a Baroque French bow by a wonderful Tasmanian, I believe, bow maker named Philip Smith. My friend George Amarim from South Texas, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, hipped me to this when I was at an event last year and I picked one up. It's been fun to play. I actually filmed an entire video comparing these two bows, playing the prelude and going between the two. And in the end, I scrapped it because you could barely hear the difference at all. But there is an audible difference and there's definitely a feel difference. And part of it is you can just sort of notice how much more hair there is on my Baron Doling bow than on this Baroque bow. So that's going to have an impact on the sound for sure. Here's open D with my Doling. Here's open D with my Smith. And I hope that audio comes through clear on whatever you're listening to this on, but this definitely has a bit of a different sound. Again, here's the Doling. Really full sound, and then this bow. A little bit more muted, a little bit uh, just, just different. Not better or worse, just different. I certainly wouldn't want this when I'm playing like Mahler or something like that, but it's, it's a really kind of cool sound for Bach. <laughs> And then the shape of the bow makes you just articulate differently. It's, you know, it, it goes like this. It doesn't go like, like this. But for Bach, it really is cool and it tends to work well out here at the tip. Many more expert people than me on YouTube could talk about uh, Baroque bows, but I'm using it for this kind of playing and I find that it just sort of lends itself to the music. I'm also no expert on Bach. I've been playing Bach ever since high school and then really in college. And I've kind of shied away from practicing it these days. This is my first YouTube video about Bach at all. I think part of it is I have a little bit of PTSD from taking so many auditions. Solo Bach is something that's required at professional orchestral auditions. And I have played so many movements, particularly the berets from the third suite. I just flash back to being in the audition room, the warm-up room. I had the same thing about bananas. I used to eat bananas before auditions. I can't eat bananas anymore now because I feel like i got to take an audition. Ruined bananas for me and Bach to an extent. But I've been getting back into practicing Bach recently. No big deal, just playing a little bit here or there. And it's just such, if you're gonna pick music to play, I think you could do worse than Bach. And a lot of people, even people that don't play classical music really primarily, they add Bach to their routine and they find that it just lifts them up, it gives them musical energy, and so it's a wonderful thing to practice. This first suite is a great place to start and my advice is generally start slow. People get a little bit ambitious. You could even start by practicing it as written here, like down an octave, just to sort of get the feel of it. I mean, you're not going to get the character that you do with the string crossings and you don't get that sort of open string sound that way, but if you just want to kind of get these lines in your body, in your soul, that, nothing wrong with that. Get it going like that. You can also do these in all sorts of different keys. This one, I think, in the Sterling edition, this old school edition, was written in C. Most players these days play it in G, up an octave, so the sounding shallow pitch. And so you start off with open G and then D, which most people play here, then you can play three or two. I really dig the fingerings that Michael Kurth has in here. I've actually been using them in my own practicing. When you're getting going with Bach, a lot of the issue is just trying to get it sound smooth and consistent. And so I think slow and separate is the way to go in so many cases. And take little chunks. I remember reading an interview with Edgar Meyer, I think I'm getting this right, that he would take Bach, but he would practice it at 16th note equals 60 and just stay there. That is some pretty serious discipline discipline. Try that and see how your life changes. It's pretty cool. I also think I remember reading or hearing an interview with Yo-Yo Ma saying that he would learn like one bar of Bach a day or maybe a couple bars of Bach, but just master the heck out of it. I think it's a great way to approach Bach and these preludes where there's no uh, natural break except once you get into the second page and you hit that fermata. Uh, it, it, it's nice to kind of section this off. And I think four bars for the first page, taking four bars at a time is a great way to go. The Allemande is sort of famously <laughs> challenging on the bass for getting this because you're playing a closed note on the G string, then you're playing open and a harmonic, and you have to come back with that closed note. So you're changing the different string lengths and weights and sort of tension feels under the bow. It's gonna be a little bit challenging. A lot of it for me is finding the right bow placement. 
Mm. And then getting the balance right on the two strings and then the speed right. The Karan is super fun. If you take it up to a brisk tempo, it can be quite the, the dance on bass and quite the challenge. Take it many tempos again when you're starting off slow is awesome. And I love the way this rings on the bass. Trying to find that B. It's like this whole suite is all about finding that B, right? We had the prelude, the alaman, now the courant. All different ways of finding B, different contexts. The Cerebond is so beautiful. Getting these double stops, working in a way that's pleasing is of course quite the challenge, at least for me. A cool thing about the Cerebon is that the second beat is the one that you emphasize, and again, not a Baroque scholar here at all, but it, you can notice that it, just looking at how Bach wrote this, the second beat is where you land. And, and so trying to make that the important beat and then trying to have the connection, but have it take the time that it takes. You know, it's written three, four. Do you feel it? Do you feel the eighth notes, the pulse? Maybe a little bit, you know, it depends. I find that if I think of it in like a really just gentle three, instead of subdividing it, it tends to have a little bit more of a flow. And I'm not being too metronomic with this, but I'm also not just going all over the place with the tempo. The minuets are so fun to play. Many, many, many different bowings and many fingerings for sure. Starts off sitting pretty well on the bass. There's that B again, right? So both Cerebon and the minuets. Exploring the B in different ways. Lots of different ways to do that trill. For me, half step trills, two, three are pretty challenging. So I try to do one, two, even if it makes me do a little bit more of a gymnastic maneuver than I might normally do. The second minuet, oh, so gorgeous. I try to make as much contrast as I can between these two. So here are many ways to play this, many places to sit on the bass. I like what Michael has. And I'm trying to connect, but also have a little bit of articulation, something I'm constantly working on. I think that's part of the fun of working on Bach, is we're never satisfied, generally. I'm not, at least. So we can always do better. It's just beautiful, it's so satisfying. And I like playing this A in the second bar, sometimes as a harmonic. And that one has a harmonic, too. It's kind of like a nice contrast. We end things with the G. So much fun. I, again, talking about PTSD with Bach, I have memories of the Chicago Symphony sub-audition that I botched this, and I didn't take the repeats, which is such an idiot move. So I, I, if you don't take the repeats, this thing's like 27 seconds or something. And then I played my excerpt pretty well. So I remember talking to my teacher after the audition, and he's like, yeah, if you just hadn't played the Bach the way it went, probably would have gotten on the list. Ugh. Live and learn. So this is just built to ring on the bass. You can do this so many different ways. You could play it. You could play across the string. Michael has you here. I kind of like that because it keeps you on the same string. Uh, the, there's the variable of shifting, but you're shifting to a harmonic, so no big deal. And then just having everything on the G string kind of has a nice feel to it. And I'm just trying to make everything ring as much as possible. And this is the first time uh, we haven't had that B so early, right? Where's the B? There it is, finally. And we have another one of those half step shifts that I try to do one, two. Does such a lovely piece. The end sequence is pretty funky on bass. But once you get it and you get a good fingering, I find that it works pretty well. This is something that when I've worked on with students. <laughs> these cool perfect fourths going up the bass and once you get it under your fingers it has a nice just just infectious sort of quality and it just sits so well on the bass. Okay here's that tip for making any of Bach's music more manageable on the bass. Start in manageable chunks, small chunks. That could be a line of Bach, oftentimes it's even a couple bars, maybe just one bar. I think it works best if you break it down and really approach it like an experiment or a science project or something like that. Take that bar, or that line or whatever, write in a fingering for every note, figure out where it should be, write in bowings, and then test your hypotheses. Play through them, how do they work, what could be better, what could be improved upon, that's a great first step. It can be easy for us bass players to sound awkward playing Bach, so recording yourself, even in the early stages, can be very helpful. Just record and listen and think, 
Do I like this? Does it sound easy? Does it flow? If not, what can I do to make it flow? You can make just about any passage flow, especially if you slow it down enough, change the bowings. So make it sound like it flows, like it's easy, like it sings, like it was written for this instrument and go from there. Finally, be patient. Progress can feel slow, but it will happen bit by bit, day by day. Stay focused, approach Bach intelligently and make sure that what you're hearing in your mind actually matches what's coming out of your bass. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, the Wabass Institute of the Honeywell Arts Academy. They're accepting applications for their 2022 summer program. The deadline is February 15th. I think this program is so cool. I was there in 2021 and got to experience it in person and it's such a unique program. It is a full scholarship performance institute. It fosters an inclusive supportive environment where ideas are freely shared from teacher to student and vice versa. All programs at the Honeywell Arts Academy focus on fostering the human spirit by performing within the community to use music as a means to connect and heal. Eric Larson, Hal Robinson, Renan Meyer, congratulations on this long running program. Folks, get your application in by February 15th and I hope to see you there. If you'd like to learn more about music you can play on the bass, check out this video we've got linked up and we'll see you in the next one.